Welcome again to our lectures on stylistics. This lecture is being delivered specially for the students of the speciality of foreign language to foreign languages, starting at the Department of English and German Languages. The theme of this lecture is Special Colloquial Vocabulary. The outline of this lecture includes the following points. First of all, we will consider the general considerations of the special colloquial vocabulary. And then we will discuss groups within this layer, such as slang, jargon, professionalisms, dialectal words, and vulgar words. Before starting to discuss special colloquial vocabulary, I would like to remind you the stylistic classification of the English vocabulary, which we considered during the previous lectures. As you remember, the English webstock can be divided into three large layers or stratum, such as special literary vocabulary, neutral words, and special colloquial vocabulary. Neutral words and some subgroups called as common literary vocabulary and common colloquial vocabulary compose the standard English vocabulary. In the previous lectures, we discussed a special literary vocabulary, and today we will consider in more detail special colloquial vocabulary, which includes these, uh, these groups that you can see on this diagram such as slang, jargon, dialectal words, professionalisms, and vulgarisms. The colloquial layer of words as qualified in most English and American dictionaries is not infrequently limited to a definite language community or confined to a special locality when it circulates. It falls into the following groups, common colloquial words, slang, jargonisms, professionalisms, dialect words, vulgar words, and colloquial coinages. They all have a tinge of informality or familiarity about them. There is nothing ethically improper in their stylistic cover coloring, except that they cannot be used in formal speech. Now let's consider each of the groups within the layer of the special colloquial vocabulary. There is hardly any other term that is as ambiguous and obscure as the term slang. Slang seems to mean everything that is below the standard of usage of present-day English. Much has been said and written about it. This is probably due to the uncertainty of the concept itself. No one has yet given a more or less satisfactory definition of the term, nor has it been specified by any linguist who deals with the problem of the English vocabulary. The first thing that strikes the scholar is the fact that no other European language has singled out a special layer of vocabulary and named it slang, though all of them distinguish such groups of words as jargon, cant, and the like. The distinctions between slang and other groups of unconventional English, though perhaps subtle and sometimes difficult to grasp, should nevertheless be subjected to a more detailed linguistic specification. Webster's Dictionary gives the following meanings of the term slang. The first, language peculiar to a particular group, as the special and often secret vocabulary used by class, as thieves, beggars, or the jargon used by or associated with a particular trade, profession, or field of activity. And the second, an non-standard vocabulary coined poised of words and senses, characterized primarily by connotations of extreme informality limited to a particular region and composed typically of coinages or arbitrarily changed words, 
clipped or shortened forms, extravagant, forced, or facetious figures of speech, or verbal novelties, usually experiencing quick popularity and relatively rapid decline into disuse. The new Oxford English Dictionary defines slang as follows. The special vocabulary used by any set of persons of a low or disreputable character. Language of a low and vulgar type. Or the cant or jargon of a certain class or period. Or language of a highly colloquial type considered as below the level of standard educated speech and consisting either of new words or of current words employed in some special sense. However, what is the difference between jargon and slang, or cant and slang in this case? The main point of slang is that it is used to escape the dull familiarity of standard words, to suggest an escape from the established routine of everyday life. When slang is used, our life seems a little fresher and a little more personal. Also, as at all levels of speech, slang is sometimes used for the pure joy of making sounds, or even for a need to attract attention by making noise. The sheer news and informality of certain slang words produce pleasure. That's why I let it meet the slang as a part of the vocabulary consisting of commonly understood and widely used words and expressions of humorous or derogatory character, intentional substitutes for neutral or elevated words and expressions. The words, which are called slang, are very often either mispronounced or distorted in some way phonetically, morphologically, or lexically. We can give the following examples of slang. To do a fleet which means to quit one's flat or lodgings at night without paying the rent or board. Rot, which means nonsense. The cat's pajamas, the correct thing. Or bread basket, meaning the stomach. The next group is jargon. In the non-literary vocabulary of the English language, there is a group of words that are called jargonisms. Jargon is a recognized term for a group of words that exist in almost every language and whose aim is to preserve secrecy within one or another social group. Jargonisms are generally old words with entirely new meanings imposed on them. The traditional meaning of the words is Im immaterial. Only the new, improvised meaning is of importance. Most of the jargons of any language and of the English language too, are absolutely incomprehensible to those outside the social group which has invented them. They may be defined as a code within a code. There is special meanings of words that are imposed on the recognized code, the dictionary meaning of the, of the words. Thus, the word grease means money, loaf means head, a tiger hunter is a gambler. Alexa is a student prepare, preparing for a lower course. Jargonisms are social in character. They are not regional. In Britain and the US, almost any social group of people has its own jargon. The following jargons are well known in the English language. The jargon of thieves and vagabonds, generally known as cant. The jargon of jazz people, the jargon of the army, known as military slang, the jargon of sportsmen, and many others. Slang, contrary to jargon, needs no translation. It is not a secret code. It is easily understood by the English-speaking community and is only regarded as something not quite regular. It must also be remembered that both jargon and slang differ from ordinary language mainly in their vocabularies. The structure of the sentences and the morphology of the language remain practically unchanged. But such is the power of words, which are the basic and most conspicuous element in the language, that we begin unwittingly to speak of a separate language. 
The organisms do not always remain the possession of a given social group. Some of them migrate into other social strata and sometimes become recognized in the literary language of the nation. There is a common jargon and there are also special professional jargons. Common jargonisms have gradually lost their special quality, which is to promote secrecy and keep outsiders in the dark. In fact, there are no outsiders where common jargon is concerned. It belongs to all social groups and is, therefore, easily understood by everybody. That is why it is so difficult to draw a hard and fast line between slang and jargon. When the jargonism becomes common, it has passed on to a higher step of the ladder of board groups and become slang or colloquial. Here are given some examples of jargon, for example, dar, from damned average razor, a persevering and assiduous student, that is from university jargon, or metlo, a sailor, from the French word metalo, man and wife, which means a knife, Manami, a sailor who is always putting off a job or work. This is nautical jargon. From the Spanish word mama, tomorrow. The next group is professionalisms. Professionalisms, as the term itself signifies, are the words used in a definite trade, profession or calling by people connected by common interest both at work and at home. They commonly designate some working process or implement of labor. Professionalisms are correlated to terms. Terms, as has already been indicated, are coined to nominate new concepts that appear in the process of or as a result of technical progress and the development of science. Professional words name a new already existing concepts, tools or instruments and have the typical properties of a special code. The main feature of a professionalism is its techni technicality. Professionalisms are special words in the non-literal layer of the English vocabulary, whereas terms are a specialized group belonging to the literal layer of words. Terms, if they are connected with a field or branch of science or technique well known to ordinary people, are easily decoded and enter the neutral stratum of the vocabulary. Professionalisms generally remain in circulation within a definite community, as they are linked to a common occupation and common social interests. The semantic structure of the term is usually transparent and is therefore easily understood. The semantic structure of a professionalism is often dimmed by the image on which the meaning of the professionalism is based, particularly when the features of the object in question reflect the process of the work metaphorically or metonymically. Like terms, professionalisms do not allow any polysemy. They are monosemantic. Here are some professionalisms used in different trades. Tin fish, which means submarine, blockbuster, a bomb especially designed to destroy blocks of big buildings, piper, a specialist who decorates pastry with the use of a cream pipe, a mirror case, a midwifery case. Professionalism should not be mixed up with jargonisms. Like slang words, professionalisms do not aim at secrecy. They fulfill a socially useful function in communication facilitating a quick and adequate grasp of the message. Professionalisms are used in emotive prose to depict the natural speech of a character. The skillful use of a professional word will show not only the vocation of a character, but also his education, breeding, environment, and sometimes even his psychology. That is why, perhaps, a literary device known as speech characterization is so abundantly used in emotive prose. The use of professionalisms forms the most conspicuous element of this literary device. The next group within the layer of special colloquial vocabulary is dialectal words. 
words. This group of words is obviously opposed to the other groups of the non-literary English vocabulary, and therefore its stylistic functions can be more or less clearly defined. Dialectal words are those which, in the process of integration of the English national language, remained beyond its literary boundaries and their use is generally confined to a definite locality. We exclude here what are called social dialects, or even the still looser application of the term as in expressions like poetical dialect or styles as dialects. There is sometimes a difficulty in distinguishing dialectal words from colloquial words. Some dialectal words have become so familiar in good colloquial or standard colloquial English that they are universally accepted as recognized units of the standard colloquial English. To these words belong, for example, less, meaning a girl or a beloved girl, and the corresponding lad, a boy or a young man, daft from the Scottish and the Northern dialect, meaning of unsound mind, silly, and fash, also Scottish, with the meaning of trouble, cares. Still, they have not lost their dialectal associations and therefore are used in literary English with the above-mentioned stylistic function of characterization. And the last but not the least, group is vulgarisms. Vulgarisms are expletives and swear words which are of an abusive character like damn, bloody, hell, goddamn, and as some dictionaries say, used now as general exclamations. And the second, they are defined as obscene words. These are known as four-letter words, the use of which is banned in any form of intercourse as being indecent. Vulgarisms are often used in conversation out of habit, without any thought of what they mean, or in imitation of those who use them in order not to seem old-fashioned or prudish. Unfortunately, in modern fiction, these words have gained legitimacy. The most vulgar of them are now to be found even in good novels. This lifting of the taboo has given rise to the almost unrestrained employment of words which soil the literary language. However, they will never acquire the status of standard English vocabulary and will always remain on the outskirts. The function of expletives is all, almost the same as that of interjections, that is, to express strong emotions, mainly annoyance, anger, vexation, and the like. They are not to be found in any functional style of language, except emotive prose, and here only in the direct speech of the characters. We have considered all the groups within the stra stratum of special colloquial vocabulary. And here you are given uh, some comprehension questions for you to better check uh, the comprehension of the lecture. And as usual, here you are given sources for your further reading to study the theme in more detail and more profoundly. Thank you for your attention.